So we move rapidly from uh, somebody from the States speaking about China to me from the UK speaking about the States, and I work most of my time in China as well, so it's truly a global uh, perspective. So what I want to talk about is fast food and obesity and uh, whether they're guilty as charged or whether we're falsely accusing them. So these are my declarations. I think it's really important before you get this talk that you know that I have nothing to do with the fast food industry. I don't work for them. I've never ever had a grant from them. I don't hold any stock in any fast food companies. In fact, I don't even like fast food. We were working out how many McDonald's I've actually eaten in my whole life, and I think it's probably less than 20. So that, that's important that you know that before I actually uh, give the talk. Okay, so as you all know, the obesity epidemic is a recent event. It's happened in the last 50 years or so, and it's an ongoing event. And what you can see from this graph is that uh, the trends are the same, whether you base them on self-report, which are these blue and, and uh, orange lines here, or whether you base it on actual measurements. People obviously uh, tell lies about how tall and how much they weigh, but they consistently tell lies. So they're always about 5% uh, lower in prevalence when you calculate it on self-report. And we know that body fatness is closely related to the risk of developing chronic disease. So this is some data on diabetes from the 90s, showing that once you get to sort of morbid obesity, that the risk in males is about 43 times higher and in females is about 93 times higher. So the consequence of that causal linkage between obesity and diabetes is that diabetes trends follow the same pattern as the obesity trends. So what happens is, uh, in the 80s, we were, uh, uh, Americans were about 4% diabetes, but now they're around about 9, 10%. And that temporal coincidence, so this is the rate of diabetes plotted against the rate of obesity for each of those years since the 1980s, that relationship reflects that causal link between the two. So looking at that trend through time, it's tempting to sort of say that something must have happened around about the 1950s. Something happened in our food environment in the 1950s that kind of changed things and caused us to sort of put on weight. So this is my mom and dad in 1945 when they got married. And we don't know what the people in that picture were actually eating in 1945. But one thing that we can be absolutely certain is that at the point that picture was taken, none of those people had ever eaten a fast food meal. And the reason that we know that is because fast food was virtually non-existent in the 1940s. The first McDonald's opened in 1953 in California, but it was, there was still only about 100, by, by 1960 there was still only about 100 McDonald's in the whole world. But it's kind of exploded, and so if you look at the numbers that there are now, in 2016, there's now 14,000 branches of McDonald's across the US. First KFC opened in 1930, there's now about 5,000 of them, about 5,600 Taco Bells. If you look across those outlets, they now sell 15 million fast food meals every single day. And if you add in all the other fast food outlets, it's about 60 million fast food meals that are being served that were not being served in the 1940s and 1950s. And if you plot, and, and what's annoying about this field is that the data is there for the number of fast food restaurants, but you have to buy commercial reports in order to get to it. So there is data in, in this sort of gap here, but I wasn't prepared to pay the sort of $500, $700 that you need to pay to buy the report to actually extract the data. So, the distribution looks kind of weird, but it's pretty clear that there's a positive, significant relationship. If we just restrict it to look at this area here where I, I do have annual data, then you can see there's a very clear link between the number of fast food establishments in the US and the prevalence of obesity. And that's been enough for people to charge the fast food industry with 
being responsible for the obesity epidemic. And so there's been an awful lot of people just completely convinced by that bad linkage. But we should be cautious because what we're talking about is a correlation and there may be lots of other things that have changed over time that could also be a, a causal factor. So here's another potential causal factor that might be a cause of obesity. And actually, if you look at this graph at the bottom over here, what you can see is that there's a phenomenal relationship between this factor and obesity prevalence. So what is it? Anybody, any ideas? It's actually air travel. It's the number of thousands of passenger air miles. And the reason that I showed this was because what I wanted to say was, of course, nobody would suggest that air travel causes obesity. But in fact, somebody has done. So when I looked just to check that nobody had actually made that suggestion, there was an article in the New York Times last year that said that air travel actually potentially makes you obese. And what they said was that frequent flyers are on average 4.5 kilos heavier than average. But when I read the article, it turned out that the de definition of a frequent flyer was somebody who flies more than 21 days per month. 21 days, but that's not a frequent flyer, that's a pilot. <laughs> so the levels that we're talking about, it doesn't, it, you know, flying does not cause obesity at the level that we're talking about. So the question that we sort of came into this was, was how can we test if something is causal or if it's just a temporal coincidence? So we assume that the fast food relationship is causal and we assume that the, the uh, air travel relationship is just a temporal coincidence. Anything going up over time is gonna be linked to obesity. How can we test between them? So we, of course you can't, but there are some things that you can do. And so what the argument we made was that if something is causal, then we not only expect a temporal relationship, but we also expect a spatial relationship. And you can see that here. If you look at these maps, so these are the CDC maps by county in the US for the rates of diabetes and obesity. And what you can see is that if you squint your eyes, you can see those distributions look the same. And so there's a, temp there's a spatial correspondence. So what we thought was, okay, if there's a causal link between obesity and fast food restaurants, then there should also be a spatial link between them as well. So what we did was we got the data for all the counties in the mainland US. We looked at the obesity data. So this is the data that the CDC collected. We then collected fast food data from the USDA. And then we looked at uh, lots of potential confounding factors from the census. So basically, what I'm saying here is the data is publicly available data. It's collected by the US government, but it's pretty good data. It's not, you know, it's some guy going around and counting restaurants. So one question you might ask is then, is counting the correct spatial scale to look for associations? And the way that you check that is you do something called a variogram analysis where you look for correlations between target places and the areas that surround them. And basically what we find is that there's no spatial correlation at, at, at that sort of uh, stepping level. So basically counties are effectively independent as far as obesity is concerned. So what do you find? Well, this is the raw data. So basically this is age-corrected obesity prevalence across 3,000 counties in the US against the number of fast food restaurants per thousand population. And you don't have to be very smart to see that there's a negative relationship. So in other words, the more fast food restaurants there are in a county, the lower the rate of obesity. So we could draw the conclusion then that fast food makes you thin, and obviously the industry would be pretty pleased with that, but I think there's a bit of a problem with that analysis. So there's two important confounding factors here. So the first one is poverty. The poorer people are in an area, the greater the obesity rate. And the other one is education. So the more educated people are in an area, the lower the rate of obesity. And interestingly, if you look at what fast food restaurant owners do, where do they put their restaurants? Well, interestingly, they put them in areas where people are marginally richer. You can kind of understand that. People have got more disposable income, that's where you want to put a restaurant. But they also put them in areas where people are more educated. 
So that was a little kind of unexpected, but the consequence of that is that you then get that spurious relationship coming out. So if we correct for those two factors, then there's a negative relationship still there. It's still significant because we're talking 3,000 data points. But if you then remove any additional potential confounders, like how many people are, are unemployed, what's the access to recreation facilities, all things that are related to affluence, if you get rid of all those things, then there's zero relationship. There's absolutely no spatial linkage. And you can actually see that. So these are the maps for the distribution of obesity and the distribution of fast food restaurants. So look, this is where people are mostly obese, around here in the deep south, and that's not an area where there's particularly many fast food restaurants. So there's no relationship between these two things at the spatial level. What about those 144 places where there are no fast food restaurants? Obesity rates are exactly the same. So having no access to fast food doesn't make you thin. It just has zero impact. So in conclusion then, once the confounders related to affluence are removed, fast food density showed no spatial relationship to the prevalence of obesity. And I'm not saying they don't cause obesity, but I think that's a sufficiently interesting basis to question this widely held notion that fast food is, is a causal factor. It's important you remember, I have no links to the fast food industry and no vested interest in the outcome of this research. And if you're really interested in looking at it, there's a few papers uh, that were in AJCN. Okay, so these are the guys that I have the sort of pleasure to work with every day. And in particular, one guy was really instrumental in this work, and that's uh, Mohsen Mazidi, and he's uh, an Iranian guy who's uh, just about to go on and do a postdoc in Sweden, but he's a sort of talented guy for the future, and these are the guys who gave us the money. Thank you very much. Two seconds to hear from that. <laughs> No questions? Really <laughs> questioning audience today. Oh, there's one there. We have to have one question, John. That was a great presentation, enormous fun. What about motor cars in America? They don't eat in the same county where they live, do they? Yeah, good point. And I have a slide about that. So what if people eat outside the county where they live? So what we could do is uh, we could just look in a state, and then we could actually say, well, OK, let's take one of these counties and not only count the number of restaurants that are within that county, but actually all the ones that are in the neighboring counties as well. And that's a distance of about uh, 30, 40 miles in any, any direction, which I think most people don't drive that distance to eat. And so we can take another place and we can repeat that through the entire place. And when we do that, it makes no difference to the relationship. So I don't think that's the answer. Hi, my name is Stefan Wehner from Belgium. <clears throat> Sorry, I would like to make a comment. I think this is an ecological study. Would you agree on that? Yeah. Because you look at an aggregate level. So we know that ecological studies, they do not give us any information on causation. Would you agree on that? Absolutely. That's what I said at the beginning. We so can't infer causality. All I'm saying is that if something is causal, you would expect it to be spatially associated. Somebody's eating that food, you know. Not there are some places that have 10 times the number of fast food restaurants. Who's eating all that food? I, I, I would think it's rather dangerous to question something that is supposed to be causal on the basis of a study that has a design that does not allow you to give a, a, a causal um, association. Ab absolutely. I'm not, what, I'm, what I'm saying, though, is that if I was standing here and saying there is a relationship, I would be inferring causality. I'm not inferring causality, I'm inferring lack of causality. And the absence of a correlation can be used to infer the absence of a causal relationship. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>